Yeah. 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 Slowly finish your private conversations. I'd like to welcome you here today. Uh, my name is Arthur Romans. I'm a co founder of the Bitcoin Embassy in Amsterdam. We're an association of not only Bitcoin enthusiasts but also aspiring blockchain professionals. It was about two years ago that we were approached by BitNation. Would we be interested in partnering and helping them out with organizing their first conference here in Amsterdam? And I said, yes, of course, we would like to do it. Obviously, I still have to look what Big Nation was and what they were doing. So, but anyway, we always, as an association, we like to help out. We like to support new projects in the cryptocurrency sphere or blockchain and decentralized sphere. And we've had the pleasure of having Susanna here and uh, her husband James and marrying them also on the blockchain, which was a, a big event. We also have the conference there in the Börse of Berlach, which is the former stock exchange building first day. And the second day, we decided to move to this location. And uh, well, that was also a great success. A lot of things have happened meanwhile. And um, I would now like to give you, okay, if you want to sign up and you want to stay in touch with the Bitcoin Embassy, the best thing is to do either go to the website, bitcoinembassy.nl website, you can register there for a free membership of the association, and or you can also go to the meetup, meetup.com, uh, embassy dash Amsterdam. Um, so then you can register there, and then you'll be in, in, in the picture as to future activities that will be organized. I would like to give the word now to Eric Polstadt, who is the event organizer and a prominent person in the Big Nation sphere. So, first of all, thanks everyone for coming. Like, I'm pretty really surprised so many people are coming. Uh, I'm sorry we don't have more space, but uh, I guess we will just uh, go ahead and uh, say something. Um, I'm sorry also about the presentation. We didn't get the HDMI adapter to make the beamer work, but nevertheless, we will just do freestyle now. And um, yeah, we will be live. We're uh, live streaming right now. On and um, <coughs> so the idea really is to just do a quick introduction of BitNation, but uh, the emphasis is really on the discussion. To, to have your participation and um, also later on I would like to have your input like on, on what are problems in your uh, daily life here in Amsterdam but we will get some more of that later. So uh, first of all I would like to, to start like what, what is BitNation? So uh, has anyone of you heard before about BitNation? Yes. Yes. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so uh, as you might have heard, uh, the idea of BitNation is to offer governance services in a way that is independent from the place where you have been born, independent from your nation state jurisdiction. So um, what we are striving to offer to everyone in the world is uh, access to a decentralized, voluntary and borderless, um, let's say, network of governance services that are um, offered through virtual nations so that everyone can create their own virtual nation with the constitution, with the law system, and with the ideology and um, culture that they, that they themselves um, deem best. And um, so that we have a market and the competition of uh, various law systems and ideologies and other kinds of things that you ever wanted to experiment to try out. So uh, that like literally every human being on earth can switch between the systems that they think best without having to move from one place to another because that's the biggest obstacle. Like uh, you were born in Bangladesh, well, uh, bad luck. You you have a bad passport. You cannot get the birth permit to work in Europe. So um, the the idea is really to uh, offer people everywhere in the world um, a world citizenship that they can use to travel and um, to to also be able to participate in, in uh, labor activities all over the world. And um, moreover, we are building the very infrastructure so that people can build their own dApps. dApps are like decentralized applications that work on top of blockchain. So 
you can um, design like a thing that you think yourself can can be useful for others everywhere in the world and um, try to identify problems uh, for, for yourself and your um, your government let's say or and your jurisdiction and uh, how it can be digitalized or how it can be offered let's say through tokens or through crowdfunding or anything that you can imagine and uh, you can integrate it with us because this is basically a platform for do it yourself uh, governance. So um, you offer services in a way that um, people can opt into them voluntarily. And um, what's more, we build this in a way that is independent from blockchains. So we create our own mesh network that is, let's say, on a uh, layer above all of this and only the, the um, very part that should be public, like the timestamps, the certificates, contracts, these kind of things, they will be put on blockchains, but the rest will be in our independent mesh network. So that even if, the, for example, Ethereum blockchain fails for some reason or if it will be compromised, we will be able to switch to another one. One really important aspect, because as you know, the blockchain industry is still in a very early stage and it will need more time to mature. Uh, and we want to be open in the way that we can migrate and use other uh, blockchains in the future as well. Um, I think, um, like, I think the best is if we can just start with questions, and then from there on, I will go on elaborating on the specific things. So, like the first, very first thing that that I would like to know about the users. Yeah. How does the mesh network work? So the mesh network, uh, we we have the specialists here, but I will try my best. Um, it works in a way that you um, do not have a centralized, um, let's say, server where the where the uh, messages that you use for your communications for chat stored in a central place, and also everyone acts at the same time as a host and uh, as a client. So um, the the messages are uh, transferred with the cryptographically uh, way. So. Uh, it should even be uh, safe against uh, quantum computer hacks because uh, we foresee that blockchains that we have now might be corrupted through uh, quantum computers. But how does, it, how does the mesh network connect to the blockchain? I can answer that later. Later? Or, or I can answer it briefly. Uh, <laughs> Um, so basically, so uh, the back end is blockchain agnostic, meaning that right now we are working with Ethereum, but they can um, we're working towards pregnant on blockchain, this is like for instance Bitcoin for the rootstock protocol, um, and we're going to use some elements of uh, this as well, so we're going to probably write another two years in the US, I think. So basically, the, the back end uh, is completely independent. It's, uh, that is just the mesh network. But then uh, when you do contracts, then, then it's smart contracts. Right, smart contracts, yeah. Then then it sends it to chains, right? So there's a node which communicates, there's, a, there's an Ethereum node which communicates inside the mesh network. So you can use that from the chat to a blockchain. Right now, as you said, it's only Ethereum, because Ethereum is the only uh, 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 blockchain which is uh, optimized and functional. Well, it's not the only one, but it's the one that currently has the biggest ecosystem yes. of contracts and community and the rest of it. So, yeah. I don't know if that's exactly what you're saying. So it's important to be agnostic because, as it says, governance mechanism kind of set of rules. So what's Bitcoin's rule? So you might want to choose a different one. Okay. But for instance, you might want to use different blockchains for different things. Like let's say if you want to um, you know get married for instance, then the Bitcoin blockchain because it's you know secure chain friends, right? Because that's like like one contract or popular like one contract. But if you want to do like a complex business team for shipping goods from Africa where with lots of parameters that can be high flexibility for, you might want to use the Ethereum chain because it's more flexible. It's less secure, but it's more flexible and it's more functional, etc. So basically everyone should be able to choose ultimately when the economy is full 
to be able to choose what blockchain they want to use for exactly what they want also, I would add something about the mesh network. The very important feature to make it work in third world countries is also that it works as a secret net. So, um, and even in areas where you have no internet access, you can still use it. By, yeah, I mean, in the way that um, you could have a relay, for example, that connects people in a 20 kilometer radius maybe to, to Pantarasa, which is this mesh network already make agreements, contracts, dispute resolution, all of the things that we all offer, even though they have no access to the internet. And that's like something really important, specifically in places where uh, there, there are, for example, some governance services that are not provided yet, like in Ghana, uh, you cannot like uh, legally register your, your land. If you want to monetize this, and if you want to, for example, uh, use it for, uh, for a mortgage loan or something like this, uh, you would have to put it on the blockchain in order to, to have a blockchain certificate and use it like that, you know. And uh, you could still do this in, the way, in this way by having it in, in an off, offline uh, network. So it's not only off-chain, but it can also work offline. Cool. By the way. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, it's pretty cool. I was wondering if you could talk about where you think um, there's initial customer-facing use cases are where the initial traction, do you think, in your mind, the initial traction mm -hmm. will come for for services built on Pangea? Yeah, so first of all, I think uh, people who live uh, internationally anyways, like digital nomads who are traveling all the time and not staying in one jurisdiction anyways, so they will be particularly interested in having a service that is decentralized but also borderless so that they can use it. Uh, from anywhere where they just happen to travel to. Uh, but also, specifically, I think, um, I mean, right now we're aiming more the, the crypto space and early adopters who already know about this, but I think for the uh, long run, the, the really interesting use case would be in uh, third world countries where many governance services are not even provided yet, where there's lots of problems with uh, failed governments, but also in the way that they want to become more independent from, from some uh, bureaucratic uh, nepotist structures. So, um, but also here in, in developed countries, uh, you would want to make use of it because it would be uh, much more convenient, cheaper, and faster to, for example, resolve disputes on Pangea than to go to a court, for example, and to have to hire an expensive lawyer to go through a long process that will most likely not be beneficial for both of the parties. So yeah, um, but you, you will we will come up with more and more uh, use cases depending on the apps that are developed on top of here. Yeah. Also, another um, potential use case is for people who have sort of intentional commitments. So, so let's say people like like us, the crypto people, they always have an intentional community, right? Or the pirates or anonymous or people who live together in a condominium, and then this is not having. A condominium association of the use of Pangea for for to govern their building right? or their neighborhood or it cannot even be like a jurisdiction or let's say a, a city state or a special economic zone for instance like out of the box jurisdiction. Mm. If you think about it, most people have to live within a legal code was established for a nation, uh, 198 nations, so that means there's only 198 legal codes, which means that all of the laws in those nations have to account for every circumstance. And what, it, what that's done is, because people can't create bespoke laws, if you like, which relate to them and the group of people they want to make an interaction, many people are driven away from using the law because it's too heavy or it's too, in some cases, it precludes or makes it hard to do because it's one trying to uh, account for every set of circumstances in which a particular process is going to be The ability to create a peer to peer set of rules and to set your agreement with somebody else, whether, as Suzanne said, it's a group of people living in a condominium. condominium or if it's uh, you know a million people who are interested in hip hop or whatever nation they want to create and set a set of rules which are very bespoke for that particular set of agreements that they're making to suit their lives creates if you like a multi-dimensional 
version of government. Right now, it's a very single dimension. It has to be one size fits all, and there are very few uh, jurisdictions. But if laws can be created, and so long, and they're opt-in laws, so the people choose to use them only because they uh, uh, they're not forced to use them. So, but it takes more. Than, <coughs> but it takes more than one person to use them because two, at least two people have to make a contract. So they're not one person making a law for themselves. Well, it could be. Well, it could be, yes. But uh, they have to make a contract with somebody else. If they didn't think they well, you agree. can make a contract for yourself. That's really some other jargon for <coughs> True. <laughs> True. <laughs> so the idea is that you have. It's possible for people to make legally binding uh, agreements which are binding and which are enforceable through reputation, even uh, and therefore get the protections that you get from making a, a binding contract way beyond the scope of the existing legal system. So we think it will bring millions of people, I mean, there are three billion people who work in informal economies worldwide, and most of them because the formal legal system is either difficult to use, corrupt, or massively expensive to use. So those people will actually be, a, it will make more things, more people get to receive legal protection rather than less. Yeah. And that will make the world safer and more secure. Right? Yeah. You're saying the judicial system is replaced by image, by reputation. No, no. I mean, so the enforcement of the reputation? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 exactly. The okay. of, so the reputation is one of the enforcement mechanisms. <laughs> As well, but for instance, um, we can create an escrow and allow the release my some service at the running places. That's also an enforcement mechanism. But then the reputation system is the most important part, of it. and I'm sure most people in here have watched Black Mirror, right? Yes, <laughs> we all see the kind of horror show of the reputation systems gone too far. So, we have designed the reputation system in a very specific way to not create that kind of you know, peer to peer popularity complex of society, which is equally dystopian in another way than governments, right? So, on Tangia, you can't, you know, your reputation isn't on based on popularity or attention, and you can't buy or sell it. Instead, when you enter into a contract, execute a contract, or successfully solve a dispute related to a contract, then uh, you get non credible reputation tokens. And when you accumulate enough, enough non credible reputation tokens, you get rewardable, rewarded with capital for, for building up good, good reputation. In regard to the karma uh, system on Reddit? Uh, no, because that's popularity for them. So people are for voting for attention. It's, no, it's an AI, it's yeah. an algorithm is looking at what you agreed yeah. to do in your contract. Yeah. Did you honor your word? Exactly. If you honored your word, then you will get reputation, but it's, yeah. also, it's provided right. by an AI. It's nobody saying, yeah. we'll upload you because we like you. Yeah, or don't like you. Or, or don't like you. Yeah. So you could be the most horrible person in the world, but so long as you honor your word, yeah. you will get reputation. Yeah. So there is no reputation without the contract. Yeah, yeah. and also there, there is yeah. no negative reputation, right? Um, so people can only accumulate good reputation. And, and the way that works is that if someone has like, no reputation, Either they just created up to the anonymous ID, you know, and that's what happens in the But most normally, you know, if, if they have no reputation, it's a warning sign, right? So there's no, you can't lose reputation if people, you know, for whatever reason. Can't be down, but it's only a warning, warning sign. It's, it's only warning if everyone adopted it. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, in my adoption, so no, okay. <laughs> Most pressing issue indeed. But it doesn't need um, everybody in the world to no. it. But it's, once you get a critical mass yeah. in, in user adoption, then you will you know, be able to compare it. Yeah. It's effective. I mean, it's kind of, if you say like Bitcoin is Bitcoin a currency or is it not a currency? I mean, the definition of a currency is a popular means of exchange, right? So it's arguable if Bitcoin is a popular means of exchange. But but it is a de facto means of exchange right now, and the more, more people that are using it, the more it's going to become a popular means of exchange. So, and, and there is, and the reputation and the contracts that you make on Tangia is obviously the same thing. So. And there's a philosophical point around whether we should use most, the way laws are enforced, the way agreements are made legally binding, is through punitive measures right now. So people are either 
yeah, their property taken from them or their lots and case. So we want to turn that on its head. Yeah. So we want yeah. it to be carrot rather than stick. It's still a strong people. It's still, a, we think, an extremely strong enforcement. Because if your reputation is not good, you have a low reputation for, for keeping with your work, then it will be more expensive for you to do business with somebody else. So there's a very strong incentive to create good reputation. But also, we, but also that you gain money. Yes, that's, that's what I was going to say. Even more, we yeah. actually incentivize it. So yeah. at certain steps in building your reputation, yeah. you actually get paid. Yeah. So, so there's also a way you get paid for being a good citizen. Uh, We've already had a lot of questions down here. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I see the, the the final version of the of what the nation is trying to create. I'm more wondered about the strategy of how to transition from the current legacy systems mm -hmm. to this new way of doing things. Because I, I see when if everyone believes in the system, then the smart contracts are pulled. And if you're in a, in a third world country where the government is corrupt, great, you have your digital identity. But in the transition phase, where it's the downbroken people who are buying into the system, but the people in power don't care about the system, how, how do you ensure that the, the agreements or the law that's observed in Pangea can be still held or protected, so if you couple, get what I mean? There are, so there are a couple of aspects. So first of all, when you make agreements, anywhere in the world, in any jurisdiction, you have a written agreement with people, or even a verbal agreement in some jurisdictions, that holds up in a court of law in any existing jurisdiction. Um, and then, so, so first of all, there's a second, there are a lot of smaller governments who are shown to be very friendly towards crypto. Like, um, Singapore, Switzerland, um, Estonia, etc. So, so, so there are, but, but big governments tend to not be very friendly. <clears throat> For instance, Saudi Arabia, let's say, or US or other kind of more inflexible nations. So there are likely to be a little bit of, you know, push against crypto in general and, and probably the nation as a extent of that as well. But so, but when you talk about how you ensure that contracts are up, I mean, the most important is not what the nation states that said that it's not. We said before, it's making a scene of this. Obviously, the most important is the character that the reputation system provides them for doing well. And second, there are the functionalities that we can build in, such as escrow and party governance services. Like, for instance, there's one application being built right now on Tangia called. Uh, the umbrella, which uh, is, I mean, this sounds a bit rough, kind of, but it's, it's like security providers, like uh, private security, technically a private security provider, you know. So, you know, some people might choose to opt into a service like that if they absolutely want to use physical force, right? So, uh, yeah. But uh, I would add for the transition strategy, um, it's also about um, diplomatic efforts. So we also want to start um, not only representative investors, but also diplomatic investors who actively uh, engage in uh, negotiations with nation states to uh, like get, for example, our big nation citizens out of, out of jail or to uh, help them to get their certificates recognized by the local governments. And uh, I think in this regard, our uh, legal team can also tell more about it. Yeah, sure. Sonia and Kenneth, come on over. Yeah, we, we can talk here, right? Come yeah, on. yeah. Uh, yeah. Just yeah. 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 This is good. <laughs> <laughs> all, all the guys down here didn't hear you, so now they didn't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, who, who are you talking about? The legal team for the me and Sonia, yeah? Uh, we had a bit of experience in the past with challenging um, systems, and uh, we will help. So you were talking about people get to prison or whatever happens. We'll kind of be the team that comes and rescue people that need a team. But of course, to begin with, we, we try not to break any rules, not to break any laws. But I don't think we are. Actually, no, we're not doing harm to anyone. 
we're just making agreements. But uh, we're also working on passports, and this is where it might be complicated. Um, at, the, at the ICO, we are planning to have um, fully functional passports for the nation. They are compliant with airport systems, um, but we might have trouble with these. And this is not something you can just go out and use. If you want to try and use it, it's because you want to take a chance. Yeah, at your own risk. Yeah, but in case you do, we will back you up. We can guarantee you safety. We'll get us out of jail. Exactly. There is. <laughs> yeah. They are Nation passport identifying you. Yeah. <laughs> and there is. I mean. Uh, just, what, one question. Sorry. Just like, uh, just like Eric said. I mean, we have ambassadors all over the world. Which Eric has a good fact. You know, worldwide ambassador system and embassies and everything, which is intended to provide, uh, you know, to provide some form of for Bitmation citizens, you know, in, in various existing jurisdictions, right? Sorry, can I yeah, uh, think you? questions? Yeah, so I wanted to ask about um, your thoughts on uh, relative accountability and how you think, um, I was trying to explain it, like the gray area between the current legal systems and what we hope to be the future yeah. legal systems of smart contracts. And say I wanted to create a nation which had a set of laws However, during this gray zone, that law was illegal where I was living. So I cannot smoke cannabis in the UK, but I, under the seed laws, I can. Which one am I accountable to? <laughs> and, yeah. you know, how, how does this... You know, I'm space as well as I do. Yeah. You know, I can't protect you against your own state. Yeah. yeah. If you smoke weed and they want to find you, even though that you're complying with some other law, mm. you're on government. But how do how do we shift? I think numbers are <laughs> borderless. Yeah. It, it is a numbers game. But if you've got I seventy also, million, if you've got seventy million donation systems who are behind you, yeah. and you're in a country where there are only five million people, suddenly they start to see them. Yeah. I don't know if, if there's a need for a transition. This was also what you asked about. Yeah. I think we can exist in parallel with the system. I, I don't think we can defeat them. Nation state will probably always exist, but we can be. Um, Parallel to other But then wouldn't we just be under nation state? What? Wouldn't we just be under form of state? Uh, you could call it that, but the difference is that you can make your own state or join another one or leave it. You know? so like that's what you cannot do today. It's like Bitcoin is another form of money. Well, yeah, yeah. No, of yeah, course, but, but, then, right? but then, it, then it just becomes, We're right? Then you have different states and we create our own yeah, state yeah, yeah. and then. And the then you bring in competition. Of course, but then, then the value of the state comes when other people in this environment respect you as a state. Right? Yeah. Not necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. No, not necessarily. Unless, unless you're fully self-sufficient, right? You can do everything. But if I want to travel, for example, I have an Indian passport, right? If I want to go to a country, that country needs to respect me as a representative of the Indian passport. I can't just be like, I'm Indian, I can go wherever I can. No, there's limitations because of my passport. Right? The, 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 the true value I see from a bit nation passport is that ideally in the ideal world with a bit nation passport I can go anywhere I want. But that's what we want and this is what we're going to work on. Yeah. We just can't do it from day one saying No, hey, of course, I, I know, I see that. So yeah. I'm just interested in the strategy yeah, that's you the way would it's use. Gonna go. We're going to challenge and challenge and challenge until they give up. So I have a question about the mesh network. Yeah. So if um, you, like I'm one party, you're a party, and we're on the same jurisdiction, and we we make a contract, and that all goes well, but we're off we're off the blockchain network, so we're on a kind of ad hoc uh, that's the right word network, maybe in the middle in a developing country in the middle of Africa or something. When does that information of that contract get stored on like let's say both mobile devices, and then when when we go back onto the worldwide internet, it doesn't then get uploaded to the Ethereum blockchain or whatever blockchain or the Bitcoin yeah. blockchain. We actually saw uh, like how the transaction works. You, you sign a transaction with your private key, and like we save them like locally. If you're not connected, and when you are again connected, we just like push them to the Ethereum. So it will, it will sync and then get yeah. through. So it's, it's built in a delay tolerant way, so yeah. it can keep working even though it's not synchronized. And when it gets back to the internet, it's synchronized. So you could, in that situation, you can have a third party. And is there just to have another copy of that transaction until it gets pushed to the blockchain? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Good. Yeah, we do. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, I wanted to add something about the transition, uh, something that I was thinking about um, what we could do to get more recognition from existing or legacy uh, nation states is um, that they uh, place some particular governance services in a voluntary way in our market. That they, uh, just by doing business with us, will automatically recognize us. And, uh, but on the other side, they will not be able to mandate people to use their services, but rather they will have a global uh, client base. Basically. So they, they can grow their, their uh, let's say, tax money, you could say, by uh, using us. And, and it's a win-win situation. They have a new revenue source, and uh, we automatically get their recognition and also recognition for the nation citizens. And that is kind of what the yeah. has already done since we're here yeah. to work yeah. together with them, which better citizens have used as all of those for example. So, so it's already kind of happening already. Yeah. So how do you speak to it? So like example, drive, oh sorry. So you could do like driving license or something, say like uh, the UK or something, everyone in the world rates their driving they're driving a test. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, that's true. Um, so then maybe Holland would say, okay, actually, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll accept the driving certificate that the yeah. UK have issued on Pangea or something. Mm. And we'll accept that through here because, oh, actually, it's more the community accept that. So everyone votes in Holland and we accept that. And then maybe, I don't know. Also, I think or maybe they don't accept it. I will accept the Scottish one or well. Adoption should happen first in places that are already um, not happy with the existing system anyways. For example, like you say, Scotland, Catalonia, like all of these uh, places that want to strive for independence, they could also use uh, BitNation in order to have a sort of virtual uh, counterpart already, like uh, existing uh, virtual infrastructure that they could use before they actually achieve their geographic uh, mon monopoly or anything. But um, the idea is that maybe over time they will realize that offering their services like this is much more sustainable than striving for, uh, like, to have the monopoly over a certain territory. So they will actually uh, have a bigger, um, let's say, base of, of users and a much more functioning uh, system with less, like, bureaucratic uh, yeah. overhead costs if they just put this stuff on the blockchain and have it, like, in a global peer-to-peer uh, -peer network, then trying to just create another uh, bureaucracy, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I was just recently uh, talking, actually, to one of the subordinates of the, uh, uh, let's say, IT minister of Catalonia. And um, like he said, OK, uh, we're not allowed to talk about this and that because uh, Spain is eavesdropping. But um, <laughs> no, I mean, um, they they actually talking to uh, several blockchain efforts. And um, I think. Like it takes a long time because like they always have to like take care of not being put in jail. Um, but uh, I think they they are also keen on, on building up something like this, and then we can already start seeing the first uh, let's say bigger uh, areas where you can already use uh, nation services without having any uh, problems with the surrounding uh, legacy state. Yeah, and if you look at our YouTube channel, uh, we're already done. Um, hangouts with several different activists groups in Catalonia about how they will build their own uh, voluntary organization, right? And it's, it's quite uh, quite popular, and we're also talking with activists in Venezuela and in other places. And so it's, it's really kind of happening. Romania, yeah, and um, kind of so it's really kind of happening in those specific communities that needs, uh, yeah. An option to the existing Also, apart from these kind of territories, I think one important aspect that we forgot are minorities, like all kinds of minorities that are discriminated against in the place where they live in. Like uh, you could, for example, imagine a gay couple trying to save their asses through marriage, which is not possible because of their uh, local law, which is uh, very punitive. So they could uh, save their asses also in a uh, blockchain smart contract, and uh, they could do so. Um, without uh, giving away their real identities. They could use uh, pseudonymous identities. So we actually uh, encourage people to use that in order to um, facilitate services without fearing government retaliation. And um, yeah, I mean, all kinds of minorities. Like uh, you could imagine, for example, a refugee nation that for all refugees all over the world offers some sort of peer-to-peer -peer services. Or uh, like I said, the gay nation 
or it could be like any like you, you could imagine like uh, all kinds of instances where it would be much easier if they if they could just um, provide services uh, pseudonymously without having uh, to fear getting this uh, government retaliation. Yeah, actually, we've done that. We did. On the blockchain, on the patient public network, in this wireless. I mean, the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring started in Tunisia with a guy couldn't get a permit to sell fruit on the on on the street. There are so there are the current if you like, set of jurisdictions, legal domains, exclude vast numbers of people. So in a way it's not, in some in some ways it is a transition, but it's also filling up this empty space. There's a huge amount of empty space where people cannot get legal protection, where they, there is no jurisdiction that suits what they need from life. They can't, so what they do has to take place without any legal protection. So what we're doing, first of all, I think, is to fill that space. And once that space starts to get filled, governments institutions are made of people. As soon as they, it's a bit like Bitcoin, as soon as people start using it and seeing its benefits and being part of that ecosystem, it becomes much more difficult for them to uh, regulate against it or to say, well, actually, there is our system and its system. Because people are part of both. I told a story just to Ed earlier that when the motor car first became uh, used on roads in the UK, they insisted there'd been a regulation that a man had to walk in front of it with a red flag. <laughs> yeah, that was because it might scare the horses. <laughs> well, right now you might see things like Pangea, just as with cryptocurrencies, governments might put a red flag, a man with a red flag in front of us because we might scare the banks or we might scare the governments. But eventually, the car was a much more effective way of getting around than a horse. And what we, the way that Pantheon will work in the same way that the currencies will work, is because it will be a much more effective way of making legally binding agreements. Yes, uh, I'm interested in peace and how big nation can bring peace. And I was thinking because you said uh, you can create a, a gay nation, for example. And what I see now uh, in negotiations is that the power to negotiate lies within the United Nations. And uh, I thought it would be an idea to also create a peace state which uh, negotiates uh, about peace, uh, peaceful solutions. But, but that's, yes. uh, I mean, Pangea uh, is, is, is more a dispute resolution platform. I mean, well, I mean, so if you look at what a government does, if I mean, now we're used to governments doing everything, you know, from roads to education to, you know, regulating uh, how, you know, what kind of country like on and on. But if you take it down to the original meaning of a government, if you just put it down to its basics, it's basically about security and jurisdiction. And what is what is the definition of a jurisdiction? It's to have uh, one or several codes of law, a way to enforce those codes of law, and a way to resolve disputes, right? But in order to protect people's physical security and but also their, their assets, right? It's, it's a protection. Um, so, so basically, uh, so, so, uh, further on in the year, one of the most important functions on Pangea will be that people can discuss arbitrators. And then when you sign a contract, you have to have a contract. You have to and and to resolve this piece. So I think I'm I mean I'm not sure what you mean by a peace platform, but that's that's what I would call a peace platform. So I I just, I just add to that I've worked in war zones for thirty seven years trying mm -hmm. to bring peace. <laughs> and I was phenomenally unsuccessful. I mean phenomenal. But what I did learn but what I did learn is that the majority of people are fighting each other because they're fighting to have some kind of power over it that they like. Well, we're taking away that. There's nothing to fight on. Yeah. Right now, Suzanne has a brilliant analogy for why uh, democracy is a problem. 
And democracy is like, if you like, the best fit to try and give us voice in that mm -hmm. power over us. So what we're trying to do, we're, we don't, we don't want to have a power over us. Yeah. We think that we can govern ourselves in an organic way. And, and if we do want to have a power over we should be after them. Right? Yeah, so we can like choose. Some might yeah. want you to, to join a Taliban, you know, there's extremely conservative yeah. or something, so, and that's fine too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so as by, long as it's, they can freely opt in and opt out, but it doesn't have to work. Right? So by taking away the reason for fighting, because the majority, as I said, the majority of wars are people who think that if they don't have the power in, in charge over them and everybody else that they like, then they're going to suffer. If you take away the need to do that, you can opt in to the governance system that you like, the nation that's like. If you don't like any of them, you can create one for yourself and be part of six others if you want to, if that's what you want. Or well, none at all. So if, you, if we create a world in which there is no argument about how we're going to be governed. We can all choose how we're going to be governed. We don't, for example, oh, right oh, now, build your own, we right? don't have to fight over which model of iPhone we have. Right. You know, we're not given, you know, two choices of iPhone, and everyone in the shop has to have a, an argument about which one we're going to have. <laughs> you know, the one who wins the argument, you know, maybe a punch up, and then, okay, we're going to have an iPhone. And then everybody has to have an iPhone. Yeah, and the same one. So we're, we're trying to get away from that. We're trying to get a society where you can choose the way you want to be governed. If you don't like any of them, you can make them your own way of being governed. And if other people want to join you, that's great. Yeah. And that, for me, that takes away 99.9% recurring of the causes of war. I like to use the ice cream example. So imagine if in Amsterdam there was only one ice cream shop. Um, was only open once every four years for one day. And then in the ice cream shop, then we had two flavors of ice cream, vanilla and chocolate. And everyone had to go to the ice cream shop on that day and find over whether they could have vanilla or ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> and vanilla or chocolate, right? And then whoever won, you know, through whatever propaganda, whatever, then everyone would be forced to eat either vanilla or chocolate. The way we see it, instead, there should be hundreds of thousands of ice cream shops in Amsterdam, and they should serve all the flavors people might want, you know, licorice, coffee, um, you know, pineapple, oh, banana, nice. yeah, what have you, right? <laughs> and they should be open every day, you know, and, and people should be able to buy exactly what ice cream they want, or exactly the time they want, exactly what they want. So we've had 400 years of... Uh, where politics has been about voice, it's been about having a voice in something that is going to tell you and everybody else what to do. So we want to shift that to agency. So that now politics, if you like, is about agency, it's about creating and joining things that you like and leaving things that you don't want voting with your people. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't argue, just build, right? Mm -hmm. But the James is saying, do, do we have um, budget for an army? Of the reason for doing a war, yeah, and the tools, the army is not there either. It's like 100% sure that we cannot go into any physical conflict. And the more people who get inspired by this version will get into more and more peace. And also, pseudo anonymous identity is not that so you don't have to declare biometrics, in fact we're totally against people having ways in which any third party can measure who they are. That also, that also takes away the uh, mechanism, the technology that enables ethnopolitics or policies based on race or on some arbitrary uh, thing that's associated to you based on where you were born or, or whatever. That takes that away. So it's very difficult, in fact impossible if you want it to be. For you as a citizen of Pangea to provide anybody with any information to identify it by some kind of biological uh, attribute that you might have. And that means it's not possible to have a genocide. So, for that reason, we also think that our system, <laughs> well, it, you wouldn't be able to find anybody to kill. So. <laughs> But, but, but I mean, like during the refugee crisis in Europe, when it was just two hundred kilos of fifteen, um, so Hungary started to literally pull refugees 
out of place and put like numbers on her arm. It's upsetting. It reminds so much about it, the Holocaust and all the horrors of world history, right? And so we decided to create a refugee ID for, for people just crossing through Europe. And a lot of them, you know, so if we take it, an example of, for instance, someone who have, uh, you know, fed from, let's say, Afghanistan, you might be of a certain ethnicity which are not considered a high like Yes, so if they go back, they will die. They will be killed for whatever reason, right? But, if, but Europe, the European Union has this rule that only Hazaras of the Hazara ethnicity, you know, get considered because they are the most um, vulnerable ethnicity in Afghanistan currently, yeah. So it says, so we try to create a form of identification for refugees when we stayed away from biometrics. So that what the only biometric we used was height, which is plausible the right? So it fulfilled the European Union's actually uh, ID standards for like uh, when it comes to the ESDCA and a lot of that and, and like the minimum necessary biometric which is height basically and uh, I think eye color as well if I remember it correctly. And then we just had a get the care system of approval, so children could have approved their parents and that's that's and that sort of things, right? And the reason we did that was because if you have close, if you get proof that you have close family, it's easier to get travel passage to that country. If it's, for instance, children and, and, and their parents and so on, or brothers and sisters, for instance. So since since a long time, we have been working very hard to provide IDs that work, but cannot be tied to a person's flesh body because that might produce just yet another killing machine. And that is, and it can be used by governments, it can be used by other groups and say, uh, you know, conservatives in Iran make a case, you know, that might not be the part of the government or something, right? So that is really a core part of our philosophy. So nobody can find yeah. in any way on Pangea, use it to search for something on the basis of some arbitrary. Yeah, and, and they so can't. It's very difficult to identify people to be prejudicial against. Exactly, and more importantly, let's say, so right now, the biggest genocide currently going on in London is uh, the Buddhist government in Myanmar killing the Rohingya Muslims, right? So imagine if they, I mean, they all kind of look the same. I mean, there are obviously some. Yeah. This is all trade. Yeah, they're obviously, but obviously you can maybe distinguish based on what area, what village they are in, and so maybe a few physical differences, but very different. But imagine if you were a Rohingya thing from the prosecution, and you went to like a nearby town, and someone could just scan you with their phone and see, like, you know, who you were, like, your ethnicity, everything, right? Then, then that would increase the capacity to kill people with, with um, an extraordinary humanity, and this is why biometrics that, that tie your flesh body to your online identity must be prevented at all costs. It's certainly not before. Yeah, not. because that would lead to an external cost. Uh, but I would add to that, like, uh, interesting, how would we um, offer, let's say, um, passport that proves your individuality right. while not giving way too much information? Sorry? <laughs> like, uh, how do we offer passports that people can use for traveling uh, and at the same time offer, like, provide uh, order to, to prove their individuality when, without giving away any information about them? Well, so there's a trade-off there, obviously. Yeah. So, I mean, I can't, I can't really answer on the passport side. That's more Kenneth's and Sonia's view. But in terms of proving individuality, to prove mm. that you are a person, you know, you are a person that exists that is not a box and that it's not ten people either or, or whatever. So we have um, a colleague of ours called Yuan who's not there tonight. Yuan Rudian, he's working on a system called proof of individuality or proof of person with the same thing. And basically that is it's based on a system called online pseudonymous so everyone has to Skype in at the same time and basically anonymously prove that other person exists and it's not a bot. 
I mean, this is the system is extraordinarily interesting, but it's it's pretty far out in terms of implementation. Because it would require that so many transactions at the same time. So there's really a technical scalability issue at the moment. But that, that will, I think that will be solved in the next about you know, two, three years. So we would have actually a fairly reliable you know, type of individual individuality system eventually. I think that's, that would be. Kenneth and Sonia can tell you more about how the task force will work and how. I think we're going through a, a compromise in the beginning. Uh, also, to, to say for ourselves, let's say, for instance, a European citizen wants to cross borders within Europe. Uh, if he brings his own passport from his own state, he's allowed to do so. He can travel freely. The document he will show from BitNation will be a request to enter the country. It's not going to be me running through the cross the, the borders, right, on, on some field. We are requesting entrance. So in this way, it's not such a big chance to try and cross a border in Europe, because I was allowed anyway. So and when they look at the passport from different nation, it will be the exact same thing as my real passport. So I cannot be frauding anyone, right? I'm identifying myself. So it's very difficult to, to, to make a case against this just to try to enter a country with a big nation passport. So at the beginning, uh, we will try and use European citizens trying to cross European borders with their own passport in the back pocket. Uh, and if anything goes wrong, we'll pull up our real passport, and they have to let us go because we have the right to travel freely within EU, right? Mm -hmm. so this way you build trust onto the actual technique. Well, at one point, yeah, we'll be trying to use this pat passport so much that, yeah. you know, what are they going to do? We're going to have this scene every time? <laughs> <laughs> Thousands yeah. of people doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Every time. Okay. Yeah. Because each identity is related, has a reputation, this is extremely difficult to yeah. get that reputation. We might have a few bots on the system, but they will be extremely well behaved bots. <laughs> it's not really too much of a problem to do bots if it's fulfilling its word, paying its bills, and so on and so forth. <laughs> so for us, the identity is about oh, who, right. who, are you, who are you interacting with. It's only important to know someone in the sense that your interaction with them and worthwhile, you will show through the reputation system that whoever you're interacting with, and nevertheless they are reliable a and trustable. worthwhile, a trustable identity. I'd just like to add that uh, we actually want to impress governments because their system are failing, and we will build such system that everyone will be very surprised and you will keep up and they cannot keep up with technology as we can, we are coming from private sector. And uh, we, we are all putting our full efforts, uh, and of course, it will be a lot of challenges since we are not expecting that it will be taken seriously a lot of times. And there will be a lot of issues and uh, legal consequences for people. We uh, will be present and we will prepare ourselves and uh, organize and uh, reliable, uh, unlike the government. <laughs> uh, and we just want to spread the big nation and the existence of it. And we, we hope that. Uh, You'll be more interested, we will have more such events, and we will go more into details uh, once the PNG up. Uh, you, you will all have it on your phones, and you will see how it works, and you will be able to contact us, and whatever you want to do. You can always uh, ask any question. Is, is there a state that has your interest? I would like to go further, like in steps of testing or prototyping. Uh, uh, let's start not recognized ones, yeah. but... <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I mean, we built the public library with the Scania's Heroes of Access program. That's we didn't go to them. Uh, I mean, Casper reports uh, that I have a history of the Heroes of Access program. Uh, basically, contacted me on the Skype, you know, and asked if, if we were interested in doing something together. You know. We had dinner in Estonia and we decided to build it. So, I mean, governments are, uh, well, well, me and James both work for governments in various different places. And we're totally against that kind of work now. But it's like governments are very more, you know, they worry in a lot of ways. And a lot of them actually fairly approachable and interested in what we do and interested in using our services for their own purposes and, and just curious and, and want to actually have a good relationship. 
So it's not like governments you know, that's where they hate us. Or and it's not like governments you know, that's where they see us as a threat either, you know. Or you know, and some are really interested and really nice what they're doing. So like this is with the Republic of Baraban, the Canadian government, for instance, their uh department but they had some department for like, you know, to share real politics and they call us to ask us for our opinion. And that this happens like on a very regular basis. So I wouldn't you know, I if everything's not black and white, there are not not the phrase drugs, really. Also, I think this will gain more traction the more users we have. Yeah. Like uh, logically, the more uh, people kind of system, the more yeah. legacy nation states will have to approve us because else they will also lose their own recognition. Yeah, That's an exactly. Yes, That's of the course. But initially, Everything is but initially, we we, <laughs> we, we have to work with us. Initially, we were planning to <laughs> sort of gamify Tangier, so it's a lot of fun to build a nation <laughs> on Tangier. You know, like Sim City or, or whatever. <laughs> and you will get rewarded by we have a, one of us is an untradable trophy which delivers uh, proof of collective. Proof of collective, which yeah. delivers a uh, uh, new pass if you get enough of it, will be gamified to enable, to encourage people to join new nations. But what we expect to happen is that an ecosystem will be created as it has on Ethereum and others. An ecosystem of people offering governance services. That if you've created a nation and your nation is very popular and you've got you know, whatever 100,000 citizens of your nation, you can negotiate on behalf of them a much better deal with somebody providing an app to provide trash collection, whatever it might be. Which is sort of illegal. And so if you are able to, to do, do that, that, that yeah. people will be buying services. Through by joining that nation because it offers a great, let's say, an insurance service or whatever it might be, because they get a massive discount because they build up the Now, if people, once people start using these services through these nations, then people are starting to make real government, which, which is, I am joining this nation because it is benefiting me, my life. It's I'm, not interested, I'm not interested in politics, yeah. I'm not an ideologue, I just have a life. And I've joined this thing and I can get a discount and on this, that, and the other, and I'm doing it. So that's how we think it will grow, not right. through any kind of ideological thing, but because if you join it's it, it's the. I mean, and the only adult audience are obviously crypto people, they are often ideological, you know, in some way or another. But I mean, that's, that's the end use, so I should use it simply because it's better, faster, should go more secure, more efficient. And we think a free market in governance is yeah. sorely needed because it's very uh, absent and we think that that will drive both innovation and uh, creativity providing governance services, which, uh, which we need, which will make our world a better. Can you explain more about the non tradable tokens? So, um, so there are three different parts of the non tradable tokens. Hello. Hello. So, yeah. So, okay. so, so every time you complete contracts, um, the AI bot that we're developing, Lucy, will uh, automatically, let's say, scan in a way that it was not a fake uh, contract, you know, where you just created a fake identity to get yourself a reputational boost. And then we'll allocate this um, POA, which is proof of agreement, uh, to your public address, which is your pseudonymous identity. And this will be, let's say, stored on the blockchain. It cannot be, you know, um, faked or, you know, transferred in a way. So it's just going to be on this public address. Um, and yeah. you will have this forever because it's on the blockchain. It's really difficult to, um, let's say, uh, forge something inside of such a big network. Yeah. That's, no, well, no, that's, that's not a token that is used no. to buy uh, services or uh, to pay for arbitration, for example. Ah. Yeah. That's two different things. The POA is just a counter, let's say, just to show your reputation, but uh, the other one is PET, which is the one that you use, for example, when you set up an agreement, when you uh, create a smart contract template for others to use. Those are the so, so uh, no, so, so I cannot, because I uh, wrote the white paper, so this happens to be my specialty. 
Ah, uh, sorry, I was too drunk. Um, okay, so this is arbitration token is an ERC 20 token, a standard Ethereum token, on top of the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, so Pangea can be used to pay for services, but but uh, I mean it's not a kind of artificial barrier to entry to Pangea the software. You can also use Ether, and you can use other ERC twenty tokens, and they run with that integrate other currencies as well. But Hatton is used as a reward for collecting non tradable reputation tokens. So the non tradable tokens are there are three different parts of them. So the first one is just like you yeah. said, people for agreement, yeah. PoA. So when when you do an agreement or when you successfully resolve a uh, dispute attached to agreement, to an agreement, you get non-credible reputation that in the later on it's rewarded with that. Um, and that's also a stripped down version of an ERC twenty token actually, but you can't trade it. So it has the one line of code removed from ERC twenty using the the send option, send the receive option. It's a it, but then there are already has, and then the second then non tradable reputation setting is proof of collective, which we talked about yeah. briefly. So basically, when people build donations, uh, the nation itself and the person or the person is building it also get a proof of collective. So basically, they get proof of collective for building a community, meaning having people coming to them and Part of the community, but also the way people operate their governance services. So let's say if they want to provide, you know, uh, let's say security and education, then they get rated on those two through basically a standard like polls from their citizens, whether they, you know, from one to ten, how happy they are, right? And that the more the happier people are, the more they get rewarded. So basically, it's, it rewards the quality of governance services provided by individual nations. And the third non tradable token is called proof of non making. So, proof of non making basically rewards people if you uh, break contracts um, or wanted contracts or vote on contracts to say which contract works best because that means the contracts themselves. Kind of become a little thing that it, it, they become, it, it, it creates like a sort of normic legal structure, kind of like common law in a way, actually, where the last, in common law as opposed to civil law, you know, the last sentence would inform how the law evolves, right? You know, as opposed to civil law, where, you know, it's very static, and, and the law that was true a thousand years ago, it still applies in the same way, right? And, and so, so basically, so it rewards. So if you create a contract that's used a lot by different people, because people, like let's say, if uh, you want to buy a car from me, right? And we create a contract you know, to buy to buy and sell a car, and that contract, and we put that contract in the contract database, then um, and, and when a lot of people use that contract because it has proven to be the most efficient one. To be fit for purpose, right? Um, and you can easily resolve the dispute, and it's it's just a good template. You know, then you get rewarded when you create a good template. And other people who say, wait, wait a moment, you know, I think this this sales agreement has some critical flaws because you know this function uh, could be hacked or this function, you know, whatever. Right? But then they get rewarded for being good at audit. So that's that's actually the only part. That of big nations that kind of is a popularity contest for people. So with, with a more kind of ready style up button down button on contracts and and kind of ability to to audit it and to um yeah that's actually we haven't started to develop because, the normal section yet so yeah because the way I yeah. think about yeah you can Right. Uh, but what happens if you do something wrong? Right. Now, with the governments, if you do something wrong, I can be good for yeah. many years. But once I do something wrong, I will get a file, I will get arrested or something. Yeah. Like everyone will know about uh -huh. With your system, if you only can uh, revise your, uh, your reputation, yeah. how can you know when someone stops you? Okay, so are you talking about contracts or are you talking about? I mean, are you talking about or uh, yeah, there are so many things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking I, about individual reputation yeah, or contract. Yeah, the individual reputation. Okay. So no, so people cannot be done. 
um, because we think that we live in a sort of dystopian society and that we are the complex and the model is a kind of black mirror style, right? And we want to try to avoid that. I mean, the reputation system is built to provide a carrot for the mistake, you know, so that people gain things are incentivized by good things to do good things. No, not out of fear. It's ignoring human nature. Yeah, because. What is it? What if I go wrong? Yeah, yeah. Because you do everything. Okay, but my people are sometimes like good things all the time. Yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah,
tools to think that works. So in that sense, it's a free market. The government services are also sort of hard with it. Yeah. Uh, like legal instruments. Yeah. And arbitration. Very important, you said. That's the important function. Yeah. It took it to uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a good idea. It, it, it's really broad. As I see, maybe I'm wrong. It's not yeah. It's not okay. All the other things are more common things. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I mean, I started with Nation in 2014, and you know, we started it with, and I, before, before that, I was thinking about this in age of 20, that was all for competitive governance for the souls and every one of us, like I'm really serious about the time. So obviously, we are extremely different from anyone else in the market. And we have, I mean, like our public notary is used by tens of thousands of people in that I would pay to them to clean and and also the only version of our GID and our system ID are you know, a number of people and, and you know so it's 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 kind of a movement. Right. Um, you mentioned before like if this sort of organic multi-dimensional governance structure for everybody comes and 99.9% of violence is wiped out. But it feels like the question that sort of your everyday Joe will ask is what about the other 1%? So like my nation has a private security outfit, your nation has a private security outfit. How do we resolve conflicts? So, sorry, I didn't understand the question. When you said the 1%, like if, if, if there is still some need for uh, physical coercion or just physical justice when there's protection, then there's, there's, there's somebody who, even though there's a, yeah, lots of ice cream, they want to smash the women's <laughs> ice cream shops. Okay, so, so, so it's not going to be part of our core services on that, yeah? However, there is um, a third part of the that is being built on the which I think is so awesome. I'm so in love with that, yeah. It's called The Umbrella. Um, it's by a uh, uh, so they are basically doing peer to peer physical security services to security to people. And I think that's genius. I mean, why shouldn't we? I mean, it's like calling the police if something happens, you can call the OBM for that guy. And then you can process it on my dream and you'll see his reputation. So this is. If you imagine a virtual nation that's not limited by territory, so in order to enact violence you know, by our military, you, you generally need, it needs to be located here and you need to be over there, and it needs to be able to make that hill over there. Well, if you're located here, 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 we know it's difficult because we've been trying to fight ISIS and some type of network organizations. So in terms <laughs> but in, in, in that sense, it's very difficult for a network organization to organize, if you like. And it would have to organize around some kind of territorial encounter, just as ISIS has to organize around a territorial encounter. At which point, you know, it ceases to belong to this world. Like. Well, no, I mean, there have been examples. I mean, there are people who are in danger. Are you gonna? This is a fact. So there are people who governments have, like Charlie Shrem, for instance, one of Johnny Lipton's daughters, who was in danger for two years. Um, Russell Bridge is serving like three lifetimes right now. So, I mean, there are like yes. there are actual people in jail from our community. You know, this is we can't. You know, we have our ambassador, and Sonia, and we can we try to help in case something like that will happen. But we can very much say, hey, they don't think it's that risk. But I think the question was about how do we deal with the potential. No, how, how do we deal with if someone smashes up on the door of the door? Well, or, or. Which in that case would definitely be the umbrella. Yeah. So that's what I meant. So you could have a protection service which operates to protect you. But basically, yeah, 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 what would happen to the guy in the umbrella? How the, how the government of this territory will, uh, yeah. what they will think about uh, the guy and the way that he defended it? Uh, is it legal for it? It's like, yeah, of course. It's, well, yeah. In terms of everything, you're I mean, sound beautiful, but like in, in after all, we are people and we are here now. And yeah, we can agree for example, that uh, we can open a uh, book and it will be for. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I love your idea and I have many things. Let, let okay, I'll tell you a story. 
So if you, if you look at <laughs> legal, one, one, I mean, one if last you thing. Get oh, yeah, one last thing. For example, I know, but, for example, I open our group yeah. for the uh, gay nation that I said that yeah. I think can be cool. Yeah. So I uh, so I get married to someone, and all the nation accept me. But when I go to the government, will they uh, 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 will they consider us as a couple? How it's gonna go yeah. when we think about taxes? So, so it's, it opened so many problems because yeah, we can agree on things with each other, but after all, we're not we're not spiritual. So, well, we're we're not, not, well, so we actually have some actual experience that since we are <laughs> <laughs> on the blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have red apples. So basically, the way it works is you create a contract, right? Yeah. And when you go to a court, right? You have a problem. That contract is still a contract, and that contract is respecting a report. It's not perceived as a marriage. They're saying that in a sense that, for instance, some governments give different tax cuts or tax deals to people, you know, depending on if they are single or married or whatever. So it wouldn't classify as a marriage, but it would classify as a legal agreement. Kind of in the same way a prenup, right? A prenuptial agreement is a legal agreement in any kind of can you ask one last question? What's the end game? The end game is. That is John Lawson. Well, I think. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I mean, I, yeah, I mean. Yeah. It seems to be a bit of bluntly, yeah. I really no, the end of the question. The question is not necessarily an issue thing. I mean, I think. Okay, so right now we have so, so right now we have about two hundred governments, right? And you have one hundred and ninety-eight options for how you should live your life. And even to be able to choose those one hundred and ninety-eight, you have to be actually travel, able to travel to them and live in them. So, and, uh, but that's not the worst part. But like the worst part is is, is what is about to happen. What is about to happen is that international organizations like, I mean, the nation state will go our way eventually. It doesn't have a global system, a global transportation, global communication, global politics, national systems, etc. And then what will come up to the nation state is far worse. It's organizations like the yeah, United Nations and other global organizations, which would decrease in you know, our ability to choose from like 200 or something you know, to one. <laughs> you know? And this, this is like amplifying the problem massively, right? So, and I, I saw this water, you know, first time in Afghanistan. Um, so, uh, during the time of uh, the car, the Afghan king, he was just governing Kabul, and everything outside of Kabul was self governing, you know. And, Many different kinds of laws and religions in the business. And it was very really peaceful. And the Soviets came in and tried to install the Soviet model. And they all started to fight against each other because no one wanted this model. And then the you know the Taliban came in and it was the same thing in various parts of the came in and it's like the same thing being repeated once again. I'm solving this. And in this case, it, yeah, and in this case, UN was really a core part of the thing that actually. Uh, so when they did what was called the Trump Agreement early on in the war, they stipulated that you know this is how the African government should look like, and, and let's take out you know the Pashtuns, which is the largest ethnic group in Afghanistan, but also the ones that, that were associated with the Taliban. So they ignored all the groups of the population when they brought in the kind of government scrub saying, oh well, we should all embrace democracy now, and uh, you know. Because that's what they learned at their liberal colleges in yeah, New York and they talk about, you know, and, I mean, it's, uh, and then they try to impose this, like young people really hate it, you know, and this is what you have to do to people. They will, and, and when they did that, this is what brought the resurgency, the resurgency back, right? This is why it's still more in Afghanistan now. And if you, if you put that on like global level, if you make you in charge of a global one level, it will be the constant war in the world forever. Yeah. Yeah. This, this, yeah. And this is why we need to have competing models. Never want to choose our own model rather than one for all models. Right? 
But I think there's another No, it will be everyone, frankly, everyone. Because there's, another, there's this another, one model and everyone has to agree with them. Like just one ice cream shop in the entire world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So I think, but I think there's another governance often follows technology in the sense that technology makes it possible for us to govern ourselves in different ways. So our world, the world of borders, actually was invented here in this city by the invention of navigable maps. Maps made it possible to draw lines and have borders. Before that, we didn't really have borders. We had like elites, you know, monarchs and so on. We controlled different spaces, but the territorial thing was a bit mushy. Now we have a different world. We have a network society. We're all part of it. We all spend all our time with people in the mind of different parts of the world. We do business across borders. But our government system is ossified in 1945 as the nation state system, with me being a democratic uh, dispensation system, which is centralized but has a lot of voices. And that's the system which will work really well when you have a mass society where you need millions of people to go to factories and build one thing in order to decide what we don't have. We're going to have a society pretty soon where everybody will have a 3D printer in the basement. That's manufacturing. So we have, we're going to, we're having a society which is working in a different way. And we want to build governance for the world as it will be, not to try and ram a square peg into a round hole, which is what we're trying to do. So there has been so little evolution of governance because of World War II and because of that dispensation and because it is the holy grail and it's untouchable. Evolution has to take place because already we're seeing frictions between the way people want to be and the way the way the world is planned to be. So in that sense, what we will we're not saying, you know, tear it all down. We don't actually have a massive plan about how it will be, but we know it's going to be an organic process in which we turn into a more network society. But we know in that we will need the two keys of government security and just as a jurisdiction. And so we're trying to build the infrastructure to make that possible. But that's also a key aspect of freedom. You don't know how it will end up. Like you, you allow people to make their own decisions. So yeah. we, we don't have this kind of master plan, but we allow everyone to take their own decisions. What if a certain kind of ideological group on the use of the nation and they have to form their system? And you might not. So they they'll be fine if they join it. And um, lots of people can join it. But as long as they don't try and ram it down somebody else's neck and want to, then it's fine. How do you prevent why do you Well, one, because it's an opt-in system. So everyone can opt in and opt out in any nation. Doing so. so they could just say, you know, I no longer So we think that we think the majority people are not ideal. The majority of people will join them to give them great services in their lives. They might want to join some neo Nazi notion on Nigeria. I could like to join But you know, that will be a, you know, that nation's body can't really occupy another nation. Well they'd have to have time to gain video games and resolve the dispute between the two. But secondly, if they then translate into a real world thing, other people, then it's legitimate, we think it's legitimate. And I think also you would find alliances with other nations saying, this is a problem for us. How do we do it? This is what we do in the world of nation states now. A lot of other nation states would say, this is a big problem with the because they're trying to push their ideas on to other people. They're trying to break the basis of the idea, which is an opt in and opt out based on what they want to say. Do you imagine some kind of almost analogous to the annual subscription where I'm going to sign up, but part of the terms that I can't opt out for a certain period of time? Unless maybe there's a, some kind of penalty. Well, if the nation offers that and you've accepted, uh, uh, it, uh, but if, you know, it will be uh, there will be a, a competition for you know the, there will be a free market. So somebody might not offer that. Might say no. You can offer that. Most people might prefer that. Yeah. Let's leave it up to us. Power. So we're sovereign. We're sovereign. 
we are agents. We can take our own decisions. We don't need to have a voice. Somebody else may want to do it for us. So it seems to be a I believe that we you know, get back to the organic nature of, you know, of, of us as people, that we will make excellent decisions for ourselves and the people we know and around us. And the aggregate building is great and much better. Yeah, I believe there would be uh, dynamic service packages for the nations. Like there would be some things that you always need. You, for example, sort of raid network where you can avoid the transaction cost, for example, for transferring um, tokens, for example, to, to uh, make it easier in, in your nation, for example, to have a lot of transactions without having to pay the overhead that you have because of the system. Uh, but on the other side, many other services would be on demand. And you just use them whenever you need them. So you would have, um, like, uh, like you have with insurance companies or other companies or anything. Like some things you do subscriptions for, other things you just pay them whenever you need them. So uh, it doesn't have to be like today where you just pay uh, like this percentage as a tax. It has to be like that. Or there could be many different uh, payment options. So if you imagine your life in a future world, yeah. I mean, and you're living here in Amsterdam, you might be part of Amsterdam, say, city, nation, whatever. You might like to think about that because you might be living in some capital or something. You might have to be part of a basic income scheme that they have, or whatever it might be. So they provide you with certain services that you like. So you might choose to be part of that. You might also choose to be part of you know, for a living, but you might be part of Software development nation, something because they provide a whole bunch of services that suit your employment. You might also be part of. I know. Yeah, but just this is a little bit too fast, maybe because there would be restriction to join the software development because I, I should be a developer, right? No, I'm sure you can do it, but if the choice is up to you. If you're so not a software developer, it might not be useful because the services that I'm offering might be distracting services. Or it might But I cannot use, use it if I'm not a developer. But there yes. might be another one that's for no, people, people who are interested in time. But you can't make it broader. There would be restrictions to join the certain nation. It would have complications in other So I said, you can also try to use it. Can the nation discriminate? Can it prevent somebody from joining? I guess when you can join me, so, we've got a direct so you can easily perform a great competition that does have this criteria but at the end it's about also achieving a we also have some practical values that are independent